Yes, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Shuchita Charma, who grew up and earned her medical degree in India before completing her internal medicine residency and chief residency at Jacobi Medical Center and her nephrology fellowship here at Mount Sinai. She's currently an assistant professor at medicine in the division of nephrology, the co-director of the native kidney biopsy program at Mount Sinai, the medical director for the University Heights Dialysis Center in the Bronx, and the medical director for the Mount Sinai Home Dialysis Program. A very warm welcome to Dr. Sharma this morning. Thank you, Dr. Levin, for such a nice uh, introduction. Um, I, um, so today I, I'm here to uh, talk about home dialysis and how um, um, the, the, there, sh there has to be a shift in terms of the paradigm um, of how we deliver dialysis and how our patients um, can benefit from home dialysis. Um, I have no financial disclosures. And the first thing um, I, I want to talk today about is um, when the patients reach the point where they do need kidney replacement therapy, so what, the advanced CKD now reaching a, a point where um, they will require kidney replacement therapies, there are a bunch of options for our patients to um, uh, 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 to transition to that to that stage. Uh, the ideal would be transplantation, right? Get, getting a kidney transplant is what we want our patients to do, um, and. Um, as much as we would like to do that as the first and the initial therapy as a preemptive uh, therapy, uh, kidney transplant has a wait list, right? So we, and the organs are not easily available, patients have to wait. And in that meantime, we, we bridge that phase for some people and for, for some, the, the kidney replacement therapy with dialysis is the, the option that we, um, that we have for them. So in terms of dialysis, we have options of doing hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis can be done in center, which is also the conventional form of dialysis that we see in our patients. And then we have the home hemo uh, dialysis, which, which is basically doing dialysis uh, in the comfort of patients' home. So um, while we talk about these kidney replacement therapies, um, one thing that, that, that we have to realize is when patients reach that stage, um, they, this is a very big decision for most patients. They are making a lifestyle change. They are, they, most of the patients are overwhelmed with this, uh, with this diagnosis. They um, are uremic. They are not able to think very clearly. Um, they're also, um, as I said, making a huge change in their life. So I think as, as providers, it's our responsibility to help them um, make an informed decision. Um, and um, even though home dialysis is not, has not been shown to have a survival benefit, there are many other benefits to home dialysis that we're gonna talk about in a minute, which uh, can help them have a better quality of life. And I think um, I, one of the barriers to doing home dialysis is the misconceptions that come with it. Also, um, there are, um, I think there are some barriers in terms of providers feeling comfortable with doing this. And I think yeah. I'm hoping with my talk, I can bust some of those myths and as well as uh, try, and try and sit, uh, make most, uh, most providers aware of all the benefits that we have uh, that we can provide with home dialysis. So I'm gonna start with asking myself a question, um, which dialysis mod modality would I choose having done most of the dialysis um, in center, home dialysis and everything, which dialysis modality would I choose if I needed kidney replacement therapy? And my answer would be home dialysis. Now I'm gonna walk you through why I think so. Uh, you could say I'm biased because I take care of patients on home dialysis, I um, I see that, but let's let's walk through those things and then we'll, we'll come up with whether I made the right choice or not. So, um, Looking at the conventional dialysis, right? What we call the in-center dialysis, which most of our patients, when we see patients inpatient, most of the patients I guess that you see in your clinic um, are, are on conventional dialysis, which is basically getting dialysis in a center uh, on a very strict schedule. So it's either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday at a certain time. It could be 5.30 in the morning, it could be 10.30, um, and they are usually very strict um, schedule and, and times that patients have to uh, be there and do the dialysis dialysis. Um, this can be very restrictive, right? I mean, patients are, um, are being asked to take out that chunk of time from their weekdays um, and then and do dialysis. This is a huge lifestyle change. Uh, if you th think about in terms of time, the hemodialysis time can vary from like 
three to four, four hours, 15 minutes for some patients. Um, if you include the on and off time that the patients take into um, to get on the machine and start dialysis, the weekly time that most patients would spend in the dialysis unit would vary from like nine to 14 hours. Um, this does not include the travel times. If you include the travel times of like, most patients take about 45 minutes to an hour to get to the dialysis unit, another um, 45 minutes to get back, or even if it's less, the average time would be about 11 to 16 hours of their week that they are spending just to get to the dialysis unit, get the dialysis done, and then get back home. We are not even including the recovery time that a lot of patients do require um, because of this um, short sessions of dialysis where major fluid shifts happen, electrolyte shifts happen, and they make patients feel really tired and exhausted at the end. If you include that recovery time, that would be another six to eight hours for some patients. It can be a little less for some other patients, but for, for on an average, it's about that time. So now we are asking our patients to actually um, actually spend majority of their working time, I, I would say, or like their awake time, um, trying to maneuver their lives around dialysis, right? It is um, truly burdensome to their daily lives. So when patients think about dialysis, when they're approaching dialysis and they think about it, they always think of how am I going to approach this? Like, how am I going to commit to this time? And if you think about it, most patients will not be able to work. It's not a surprise that a lot of our dialysis patients are unemployed because of this reason. I mean, most of their time is going on doing dialysis and getting to dialysis, right? Now, if we look at the home dialysis, there's a lot of flexibility and, and, and convenience that comes around with the home dialysis treatments. If patients do PD, they could do PD peritoneal dialysis overnight. Um, they could do manual exchanges, which takes much less time, and they could be doing it at, in their own convenience. Home hemodialysis, it's more frequent dialysis, but they're doing it at their convenience. If they have to work, they do it before or after work. If, um, if they have some commitments that they have to do, they can change the time. Um, as long as they are not missing treatments, they can change the days that they are doing their dialysis based on that. If they're doing five days a week, they may change those days uh, during a week's time uh, in order to accommodate their treatments. So home dialysis is more patient-centric, right? And it is providing patients with more independence. Uh, patients have much better control over their time. And when, when patients get to know about this, they always they would want to choose this as long as they can do it. They would want to choose this because they, they have a little bit more auto, um, autonomy on their lives as well as better quality of life, right? I mean, if we all had to think about it, we would want our times to be ours and not be governed by a Monday, Wednesday, Friday at like 5.30. I got to be there every single time, you know? So um, this this probably even helps with the compliance because they're, they're, um, pa patients will feel that they have more control over their lives. Okay, so what are the other benefits? So conventional dialysis, as you see, there is only one option, right? There is only one way of doing dialysis, three times a week, three and a half, four hours. Um, they, it's, it's almost like, even though it's individualized to a patient, it is really like bound by those times. There's also the big intra-dialytic gap of like, of two days when we do the conventional dialysis. Um, in terms of home dialysis, we have more options, right? We can do peritoneal dialysis, which can be done as a manual PD, where um, basically there is no machine involved. You're basically using the gravity as the way to do dialysis, where um, there could be machines, which is more, more commonly used by our patients because you can put yourself on the machine overnight, go off to sleep, finish your dialysis when you get up in the morning and you're ready to go. Um, home hemodialysis, where if, if PD is not an option, or even for patients who choose home hemodialysis because of its um, benefits, uh, can do dialysis at home. Patients can be trained. They usually require a care partner so that they, because there's a, a little bit more involvement of the patients um, and uh, it is safer. So we require a care partner for that. But in general, there are many options with home dialysis that patients can choose from. The other big option with home dialysis is that you can intens intensify the, the, the treatment. You can have more dialysis with the home hemodialysis. Also, PD is more continuous dialysis rather than doing three and a half um, uh, or four hours like every other day. So you're basically uh, giving them a better and a gentler form of dialysis here. So um, what are the other benefits? So it has so 
uh, home dialysis is, has shown to have a better preservation of residual kidney function. And this has in turn been shown to have better clinical outcomes. The patients have lesser fluid restriction, lesser dietary restrictions um, because of that. Uh, they can manage their fluids much better. Most of our, uh, our PD patients are, are rarely ever hyperkalemic, so they can have a better diet. Um, the patients treated with PD, um, studies have shown now that PD has had a better, um, patients on PD have better cognitive functions and lower de dementia risk compared to conventional HD. Um, also, uh, patients with certain uh, disorders like uh, or diseases like congestive heart failure and liver failure where um, they may be a poor candidates for HD because they are not able to tolerate the, the fluid shifts or major fluid shifts that happen with HD may tolerate PD better. So, they, so as we go on, we see that there are many benefits that patients can and can see. Obviously, patients' choice is is the first, but they uh, and they're looking at their time and their um. But there are many clinical benefits as as well when we see this. And then. Um, the, um, the major benefit of home dialysis comes also from the intensive and frequent dialysis that we can do, and we have the choice of doing with um, with the home therapies, right? So. If, um, if I go by that, so the long intradilator gap with the conventional HD has been shown um, to, um, to increase the risk of, of mortality and morbidity in patients. There, the, it's simply, um, un, there is um, unphysiological fluid and sol solute accumulation that happens in that longer gap, uh, which put, puts a lot of stress on the heart as well as peripheral vasculature. And this, uh, many studies have shown and suggested that this interval is associated with higher risks of mortality and morbidity in patients. So I'm going to show you right here um, the, uh, the, 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 how the rate, rate of death with the two-day gap. So if you look at this, the blue line shows the, the uh, rates of death and different reasons um, on the, with the two-day gap uh, of dialysis, and then all the other days are shown in gray. And if, as you see, there is a 23% higher rate of death when these a two, when this two-day gap is seen. With the other days, it's it's lower. Um, and cardiovascular hospitalization is more than 100%, like it's more than double uh, the rate when with the two-day gap. So if we can ameliorate or if we can change this gap, we can we can make patients dialyze in a way that they don't have this two-day gap, we can, we can help them have better outcomes, right? And that is possible with home dialysis. Um, the other big thing, so there were, there have been a few trials that have um, have shown other clinical benefits with the intensive dialysis, and the one is FHN trial, which is the frequent uh, hemodialysis network nocturnal trial, and there is there was an uh, older trial which was a, a smaller trial with Albert, which is called the Alberta trial, which basically uh, compared the patients on. Um, frequent hemodialysis, which was described as six days a week, uh, uh, and this was nocturnal dialysis, compared to the conventional hemodialysis that we see in our in-center patients. And what they found was that patients on intensive dialysis have lower LV mass. Both the studies found that there was lower LV mass. And as we know, LVH is associated with um, worse outcomes. So if we could lower the LV mass, we might be able to make a difference in terms of their, of their cardiovascular um, outcomes. Um, the, the, the difference was all about 11 grams with the, with the FHN trial, and then with the Alberta trial, it was shown to be about, uh, I think, 15, uh, 15 grams in terms of the LV mass, the way they calculated. And with the FHN trial, they had about 85 patients um, on it who were randomized to either getting the nocturnal dialysis, which was six uh, nocturnal uh, frequent dialysis, which was six nights in, uh, a week, and then uh, the conventional was three times a week. Okay. so. The other uh, big benefits that we see, and we have a lot of, um, I'm sure a lot of our primary care physicians do see patients who are on dialysis, whose, uh, whose blood pressure are uncontrolled. And intensive dialysis significantly um, has shown to be, in these two trials, it, sh it was shown that uh, it reduces the blood pressure and the need for a number of antihypertensives uh, significantly with these, um, in these trials. So if the frequent, uh, in the frequent nocturnal the, uh, trial dialysis, if you see the, the there was a decrease in um, the, so the blue line is at the baseline when they started dialysis, and this was after 12 months of dialysis. And at the end of the study, they saw that there was there was a there was a significant decrease in the in the blood pressure. Um, same was true for the Alberta trial, where they saw a decrease in the blood pressure, which was which was 
pretty decent. And also the number of antihypertensives was decreased on an average from about two to one um, in this FHN trial. And it was from two to 1.6 in the case of conventional dialysis. Um, also, more frequent HD helps with better phosphorus control. So uh, in the same trials, when they looked at this phosphorus, so it is not a surprise that when you do more frequent dialysis, uh, you're able to take off more phosphorus from the body. We use binders to help patients control their, their um, phosphorus, but not they, the, the binders can only act in um, to a certain extent. They can only bind to a certain amount of phosphorus. And with dialysis, we do uh, we are able to clear the phosphorus from their body. So if we do more frequent dialysis, we, we do get better serum phosphorus. And so that's not a surprise. And as we all know, serum phosphorus and um, has, a, has a, um, if, if they're higher, they have more effect, uh, they have a worse outcome in terms of the cardiovascular, um, the, the cardiovascular outcomes. So, uh, so as, as I said, so in this trial, the, the mean from the, at the start of the study went from more than, um, it was about 5.6 to 5.7, went down to about 4.6, 4.7, which is where our goal is. Um, if you see in the Alberta trial, it was even, even more, uh, it came down to about 4.5. So basically it helps with the better, um, better phosphorus control as well. So the other big benefit that we see is in terms of cost to our society, right? I mean, um, we, the, the home, the hemo, the, in general, the dialysis is a very costly uh, procedure. And if we can decrease the amount of cost to our society, that is, a, that is also a big benefit that we can see. So if you see um, from the USRDS data, um, over the last 10 years, the, the cost of PD has always been lower than H, the in-center HD. And th that is, again, in the in-center HD, there is a lot of cost that is involved in terms of like setting up the dialysis unit. There is infrastructure involved. There are more nurses. Um, so, uh, so nursing time. Um, the, um, the whole infrastructure requires a lot more cost compared to PD, which is done by the patients at home and it, uh, or, it, um, or can be done um, in the comfort of their home. So the infrastructure involved is not as much, right? Okay. So with this, I'm going to summarize the advantages of home dialysis. So again, patients have a better quality of life and more autonomy. Um, they the, the clinical outcomes are either equal, equivalent or in some cases a little bit better if we could do more frequent dialysis. There is lesser hemodynamic stress that happens because they are gentler forms of dialysis. They are, they are happening over a longer period of time um, rather than shorter, very, like shorter intermittent dialysis that we are doing. There is longer preservation of residual kidney function, which helps better outcomes, uh, lower cost, involve less infrastructure needs for, for uh, performing home dialysis. And a big thing that we saw in this these last two years with the in the time of the pandemic, I think home dialysis, especially when we had the initial, uh, the surge, um, the home dialysis really helped patients shelter in place and less, there was less chance of exposure of these patients. There was, they didn't have to make three times a week trips to the dialysis unit. They were not taking public transports um, or um, transportation companies. Um, they um, they could stay at home and do their dialysis and we even provided televisits for the monthly visit when they have to come in so there was a lot of things that we could change and do with the home dialysis patients when we compare that to the in center either patients were missing dialysis because they because they were scared to come out or if they came out they were they were at a higher risk of exposure at that time right i mean we were still learning about the whole um pandemic in the beginning so so I must say that we there are many more layers to home dialysis and the benefits that we are seeing with it. And then obviously the more frequent intensive HHD, uh, as I said, have um, it basically has m many advantages to it as well, right? Elimination of the prolonged two-day intradilator gap, better blood pressure control, regression of LVH, better phosphate control, and shorter recovery time from dialysis uh, treatments because these are gentler forms of dialysis and they, they feel better with that. So after I have walked you through all the benefits so far, um, um, I don't know if I, some people still think that I'm biased about choosing home dialysis for myself if I ever needed it. But I can tell you that most, what the most nephrologists when they were surveyed in 2010, uh, and that was the survey was sent to about 500 nephrologists, um, and I think about half of them replied, uh, but they, they showed that most nephrologists would either would, would choose either 
form of, dia of home, hem home dialysis, either home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Um, only 6% actually chose in-center or conventional hemodialysis. So I think people, so nephrologists who are dealing with this, who know the benefits of this, would always want to choose this for themselves. Like most patients would choose this, most uh, nephrologists would choose this for themselves. So um, there's something to it. Uh, however, if we look at the, the real number in the same year, uh, the actual percentage of people, prevalent patients who were receiving conventional HD was 92%. So there was a huge discrepancy in terms of what the providers um, think is the best therapy for themselves or their patients, but what exactly was happening. Um, so if we look at the current status of home dialysis in the US, um, if you see the United States is not like if you see there are many other countries that do more of so the blue line is the is the home dialysis, um, basically PD, um, and that is much more common in other countries than some of the other countries than United United um, States. If you see it um, here. Um, it's about 10%. So only 10% of the patients are on PD and a small percentage on home HD. Um, other than that, most patients do receive, um, in, so 90% or 95, 85% uh, 90, to 90% of the patients require, uh, receive in-center hemodialysis. Um, if you look at the incidence rate by modality, uh, again, if you see how many patients start on in-center HD compared to PD and HHD, it's really, I mean, it's a huge discrepancy that we see here. Same is true for the prevalence population. So ESRD prevalence by modality, if you see, the most patients are, are started on in-center um, are on in-center dialysis um, compared to the uh, compared to PD and HHD here. Okay, so uh, why is there such a big gap? Right, um, and what are the barriers that are that are stopping us from utilizing home dialysis more? Especially given that we have so many benefits, we most most people would choose um, home dialysis if they knew about it. Um, why is there such a big gap? So there are a, a, a bunch of um, uh, barriers that have prevented or are preventing us from optimal utilization of home dialysis. And they can be patient related. Um, lack of education, patients are not aware of their options. They do not know um, or they're not told about the different forms of dialysis. Um, it's a knee jerk reaction that if a patient needs dialysis, put a permacath, get an AV fistula and start them in um, and in, uh, in center dialysis. I think we've seen that to happening in the in the hospitals. Uh, some patients do crash in the in the ER with like with, with really poor kidney function and then we end up starting them on um, hemodialysis and sending them to in-center. There, there can also be psychosocial barriers that may prevent our patients from doing uh, home dialysis even though when they know about that. Um, the other uh, big one is a physician and provider related, right? I mean, they can, they, there has been um, a, the, the, the thought that there is inadequate training amongst our, our fellows and there is lack of confidence in providing home dialysis and um, it's uh, and that can prevent us from doing home dialysis and then the other thing that that is a big one which um, we'll focus on today are the misconceptions regarding the therapy we we do come across where we have talked to our patients um, about home dialysis and yet the patients come after speaking to their uh, to their primary care physician or their cardiologist and and they're not sure because um, they they they, they have some questions about the therapy and they're not sure whether this is the therapy for them. Um, and um, the, the, the misconceptions are not cleared for them by their, by their care, care providers. There can be clinical reasons, like there can be um, certain uh, 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 contraindications from doing certain kind of therapy and that can always be there. And those can be some barriers. And then financial barriers, like patients uh, need to have a home, a place um, that, um, and if if a care partner is involved, there may be some financial barriers there for the patients to provide it. There's also financial barriers in terms of the the reimbursement for the for the nephrologist and the dialysis unit that may have uh, that, that may have an impact on the utilization of home dialysis. But the two things that we are going to focus on today um, in terms of the barriers is going to be patient related and the physician provider related, especially the misconceptions that we, we hear and see um, from our patients about that. Um, okay, so lack of patient education. So it, in many surveys that have been done, it has been seen in the past, it has been seen that only a third of the incident patients um, 
are educated or presented with all the treatment options when, at the time when they start dialysis. Um, CMS has required most patients, all patients to be educated about their modalities once they are on a certain therapy, once they are in the dialysis unit, but many patients do not know their options when they are starting uh, dialysis. And um, also patients' knowledge about dialysis modalities is limited. Um, when we present and how we present the modalities is very important. If, um, if we go and tell our patients, um, there are three kinds of modalities that you can do it at home, a lot of patients have a fear of how they're going to do this. So um, they, they may not have the knowledge or the understanding of the different modalities, what it entails. And if they're not provided proper information and in a, in a way that they understand it, um, they may not be able to make an informed decision at that point. Um, and then their understanding of advantages and dis, uh, disadvantages of dialysis itself and the home dialysis may not be, may not be adequate, right? It may, um, as I said, it may, may not, they may not have all the tools in order to make an informed decision about that. So um, if we look at what education it has and um, what is the impact of the education on the utilization of home dialysis, there have been many, like many studies, but the main ones, I'm going to uh, show you a few. Um, there, um, there is National Pre-USRD Education Initiative uh, that basically um, show that pre-dialysis education resulted in two to three-fold increase in the incidence rates of patients who initiated um, therapy, um, that, uh, dialysis on home therapies compared to the actual incidence rate um, at, that, at that time. There was also um, a, a, a treatment options program that was started by Fresenius Medical Care where they showed that that utilization of PD was about eight times higher among the tops educated patients. So once you educate the patients, more patients are likely to choose. And the, and the numbers are really, really, um, are, they're, um, they're very impressive, right? I mean, two to three fold increase in the incidence rate of patients starting home dialysis in another study about eight times um, the, the, the actual number. And um, it, is, uh, it is impressive how it can make a huge difference. Another study showed that most patients would choose PD and, and some patients would choose the HHT. So you could increase the number of patients utilizing home uh, dialysis if you educated them, right? So more education, there was the, the uh, CPE clinic, which basically educated the patients about their, their, um, their options and that would increase their, um, their chances of choosing the home dialysis. So again, I think the biggest tool that we have is educating our patients and educating our patients in a way that they would understand, not just, a, I think, a few minute session where we just tell them about their options. Um, and I think it needs to be um, it needs to be more than more than just knowing the options. It is more about like getting to know what it entails, how it's done and what is required out of them. So even in unplanned dialysis, which we see quite often in the hospital, right? I mean, we have patients who crash, what we call the, the crashers in the ED, um, that actually um, have um, uh, either were not aware that they had a, they had kidney failure or they, they, they actually um, had, um, uh, had not been following with a nephrologist or were lost to follow up. Um, they, uh, they, they, in these patients also, if you educate these patients after they start, they are in the in the hospital, it, the education program has been shown to be a pretty strong in, uh, predictor of whether the patient would choose PD or not. And the odds ratio is about 4.7. So it's pretty, it is pretty impressive, five times higher um, than in patients who are not told about the options. So again, education program, cannot be overstressed. We educate our patients, we make them uh, aware of the, of the options that's available and they make the right, cho right choice for them. So let's look at the physician provider related barriers. So in, in, um, in the past, the, the emphasis uh, was more towards dialysis. Most of the patients, most of the people who were coming out of fellowships, most of, most of the nephrologists and the doctors who were coming out of um, the fellowships were did not have adequate training and less exposure to home dialysis. Now this is a vicious cycle, right? We have lesser patients who are on home dialysis. The lesser patients, the, the fellows will see the lesser 
will be their comfort level in managing these patients. The more patients there are, the more exposure they get and the more they, um, they are comfortable in managing these patients. Um, so there has been more emphasis on home dialysis during fellowship training over the last several years. And e some programs, uh, even our Mount Sinai, actually we are one of the, one of the first ones, have started the post-fellowship home dialysis training program, which is a year of intensive training in home dialysis in somebody who would like to specialize in that, in that area. There are also phys physician-directed education uh, through conferences, online education programs, and web-based interactive tools that are now available for, pay for providers to get more comfortable with this. And there have been many efforts in terms of like support programs like home dialysis, uh, university, and advanced renal education program, which have helped um, most of the nephrologists and the trainees to come, um, uh, up, come aboard on um, home dialysis and how to manage these patients. But there are many misconceptions that revolve around um, home dialysis when it comes to our patients. And I think these uh, misconceptions, um, as well as uh, the comfort or the discomfort uh, um, that, pay, that uh, providers feel around the home dialysis can play a big role in terms of the patient's choice. So um, patients do rely on, on um, their providers for a lot of a lot of information, as well as sometimes they, they want that guidance in order to make their choice and some uh, and their primary care pro uh, physicians sometimes they're cardiologists um, they could be their liver doctors um, they could be their nephrologists I mean whoever they had the best relationship with they look up to these providers in order to um, in order to get the right kind of uh, information and I think if we um, if we can talk about some of these misconceptions that I that we have come across I think it may be, may help us uh, help our patients make the right choice for them. So one of the misconceptions that I uh, come across when I see um, the patients in my clinic, they come, I have been told that the prevalence of infections, I'm very likely to get a peritonitis. Um, and when I go on conventional HD that or like in center HD, that would not be the case. So uh, let's look at some of the data that we have in terms of the, the infection, right? So the, the access infection rates are, um, the, the peritonitis infection rate is very similar to that of an AV graft. And it is much much, much, much better than having a permacath. Like catheter-related bacteremia is much more common uh, in terms of infection. And if you see this, this is episodes per patient here. Um, PD-related peritonitis is, um, is not as high as the catheter-related. AV fistula would be the best. Having said that, the bloodstream infections are much more likely to cause a severe morbidity and mortality compared to the peritonitis. Peritonitis, the outcomes are usually pretty good. Even if they were to get a peritonitis, there is very infrequent, if we, if we catch it early, we treat it, they usually don't even have systemic symptoms. Um, and they, uh, there is infrequent chances of adhesions and, and sclerosis. Having said that, if you have a catheter-related bacteremia, there is very frequent chance of endocarditis and other septic complications and much worse outcomes. Same is true for AV graft infection and AV fistula infection. So even though the rate is comparable uh, for, for PD-related peritonitis and AV graft, the outcomes would be much worse if you were to have a bloodstream infection. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And, um, and um, I, I, I hear this quite often with my patients when I'm talking to them about different forms of dialysis. And I thought this would be something that we should talk about. The other big thing that we uh, get is the misconception that mortality is higher in PD than in HD. And um, that is, again, if we look at the USRDS data, that is actually not true. Uh, it is pretty comparable. It is, uh, in fact, if, if we, I wouldn't want to say that this, the mortality is better in terms of PD than, than HD. It is actually pretty comparable. And many studies have been done on this and seen that there is, um, there is not much benefit in terms of um, mortality, whether it's PD or HD. So the other one that I see, PD is not a good option because patient has liver cirrhosis. And we hear that sometimes. We hear from our patients that I can't do this because I have cirrhosis. And uh, we're not talking about decompensated liver cirrhosis, which can also be an option. But but in, in cirrhotics, I mean, patients who are compensated and, and maybe um, maybe live, waiting for a liver transplant or, um, or just, um, just compensated cirrhotics. So if we look at uh, some of the studies, so this was a study in the peritoneal uh, in PDI, which is basically um, looking at uh, about 
And so this was a Korean study, which basically looked at about 1,300 patients on, on PD, um, out of which about 45 were cirrhotics. And they compared, they did a, a multivariate Cox analysis in terms of how um, the, the, are the, to compare in the two groups where what was the technique failure, what um, what was the uh, the mortal uh, the, the mortality in these patients, and also what was the peritonitis free survival rate. And if you see, I think for uh, for the technique failure, um, which is basically whether the patient could continue on PD versus um, or they had to be switched to HD. Um, again, there was no difference. But I think the two things that we worry about are, are I have heard a lot of worry about is whether they will uh, they will have more risk of peritonitis or whether they will have worse outcomes. And in terms of survival, there was no difference as you see in the two groups. Um, the non-LC is a non-liver uh, cirrhosis uh, PD group, and then this is the LC is the liver cirrhosis. And as you see, the the, the two um, the two plots are pretty pretty uh, like they're similar, right? Uh, same is true for peritonitis free survival rate. There was not increased incidence of um, peritonitis in the patients who have liver cirrhosis. So again, um, I think we have some misconceptions and um, and these studies help us make an informed decision where we can say this this is. And in fact, in patients who are cirrhotics, the, given that the blood pressures are on the lower side, the, they may not they may have difficulty tolerating hemodialysis to begin with. They have lower blood pressures, the fluid shifts are much harder to manage compared to PD, which is much gentler therapy, and they may be able to tolerate that. The other big uh, help that, that sometimes can be is the ascites, right? You have a PD catheter, you can perform PD as well as drain out the, the, uh, the acidic fluid um, and help them feel, instead of doing like, you know, weekly or bi-weekly taps, we can actually have that option for these patients as well. So something to keep in mind. The other one, PD is not a good option when patient has heart failure. Um, again, I think PD has been shown to be um, shown to be pretty beneficial. Uh, patients who require um, uh, kidney replacement therapy and are, have difficulty tolerating, especially the heart failure patients who have difficulty tolerating fluid removal with conventional HD, um, they usually tolerate the fluid shifts a lot better um, with the slow gentle ultrafiltration that's involved with PD. In fact, there are studies that have not even for kidney replacement therapy in terms of the electrolytes and the and the clearances, but PD has been tried in patients uh, with CHF, with diuretic resistant heart failure. Um, and it has been shown to, to help with the symptoms as well as reduce the hospital admissions um, and the length of stay of, of the hospital uh, associated with um, the heart failure. And so it can be used even in patients sometimes where we are trying to remove fluid, uh, but the diuretic isn't, isn't working. Um, so without the need for clearance as well. So this has been tried in, in some in some studies and it has worked pretty well. So again, we have a, a misconceptions. Some of us, this is what I hear from my patients. If there's anything else that I can help with, I will, I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. But these were the big ones that I've come across when I see the patients. Some of the other ones are, oh, well, High, home dialysis requires a, a higher level of education. The patients need to be um, need to be really well educated. They might not be able to manage it. And when we see our patients here in our clinic, that is usually not the case. The patients are treat as long as they are literate and can read uh, and write, they can do this. It's more of a patient motivation whether they want to do this or not, uh, which plays a bigger role in how and um, how well they will be able to manage it, rather than their level of education. The other uh, one that we get is home hemodialysis dialysis is too complicated to be performed at home um, by the patients. And um, in to be honest, we have patients, um, uh, again, it's, the, it's, a, it's a matter of motivation, but these patients are trained very well. They, get, they go through a nice extensive training, um, and we are here for their support um, when they do the dialysis through a phone, through a, 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 a video teleconferencing, whatever needs the, the patient needs in order to be able to make um, this work for them, we work with them to help them out. So yes, it, it is a little bit more complicated than PD, but it is not something the, the machines that are out there, they have made it really simpler and easier to manage rather than the bigger machines that we use for in-center dialysis at this point. So um, th there's a lot that um, that can be done with these machines and that and, and these patients can be trained very 
pretty nicely on these machines to be uh, to take care of themselves. The other one that we uh, also hear about is, is that PD requires a companion at home and I don't have a companion, so I can't do it. This is uh, really not true. Patients who live by themselves can do it. As long as patient himself is capable of doing the, the dialysis, there is no reason that they require a companion. HHD, yes, we usually require a, a care partner to help out with certain things. And also, even if the patient is the one who is doing everything, we want that they, um, we want uh, the care partner to be around so that if something were to happen, they can call um, for help. Well, with PD, that is not a requirement at all, um, unless the patient is debilitated and cannot do it himself and requires somebody else to do it for them. Um, so with that, I think um, we have talked about a lot of misconceptions, and I'm more than happy to answer some more other questions at the end of the talk. But is home dialysis for everyone? So after talking about the benefits and some of the misconceptions, so obviously not, right? I mean, not really. It, it Home dialysis is something that is... Um, that has to come from patient. The patient should be motivated enough to be able to do it, right? It is a matter of patient's choice. If they want to do this, they will be able to do this. We have the tools to help them succeed and and do this um, and make their um, make uh, their quality of life better. Um, there can be a lot of medical contraindications for doing these therapies, right? I mean, prior abdominal surgery, surgeries and a very scarred abdomen with adhesions inside may prevent us from doing a PD successfully. Presence of a PEG tube. Um, history of uncontrolled seizures can be dangerous for patients who do home hemodialysis because um, that, that, I mean, when you have needles in your arms and you, if you were to have um, a seizure episode while you're on the dialysis, that can be pretty catastrophic. So those are the things that we look out for. Uh, but there are very few absolute contraindications that would prevent us from doing these therapies. There, uh, most of the others we may be able to work around. Obviously, the home situation, right? If there's patients, um, especially in the New York City area, I mean, the apartments are small, they may think that they may not have enough place. But that is, again, and not an absolute contraindication. We can actually work with them to see what needs to be done. We could change their, their layout. We could help them clean up. Uh, we do a lot of things so that we can make this work for them if the patient really wants it. But then home situation does make a big uh, play a big role whether they can do home dialysis or not. And then came care partner for home hemodialysis, which is, which is again, as I said, is, um, is, requ is required. And it is something that helps um, patient keep safe. So I think that is something that we, we require for our patients um, when we choose them for home hemodialysis. Um, so how do we proceed with our um, with, with our patients here, advanced CKD patients here at Mount Sinai? Um, so patient, uh, the, the way it works is we actually have a, a CKD dialysis modality educator uh, who plays a very vital role in educating our, our patients. So she, uh, these advanced CKD patients are educated, they are sent over, they're referred to the CKD educator, and they are educated about their op options for renal replacement therapy. Um, they, um, more, most of the patients that are going under um, are ready to start dialysis are educated about their options. If the patient absolutely says no, I do not want to get more education. I just want to go to in center. Um, we we go ahead with that. But if the patient is interested, we, they always get educated about their modality choices. Um, once the patient is, is shows interest in home dialysis, they want to know more, then they are referred to our home dialysis program for evaluation and further education. Um, the goal is not to look for an ideal patient. We're not looking for the best patients for our program. What we want to make sure is that we are screening them for any medical or psychosocial conditions that may prevent them uh, from doing the self-care dialysis um, successfully. I mean, we want to make sure that, uh, or we want to at least make sure that we haven't missed anything that would you know, right away make the patient a bad candidate in terms of home dialysis or may put the patient at risk. So um, going through the uh, going through the, the flow, flow uh, diagram here, the way we, again, do it as education um, is provided by the CKD educator uh, uh, regarding the various modalities. If the patient is interested, then they are sent to our home dialysis program. We show them the machines. We show them how things are done, what is expected, how we are going to train them in our program for PD. The training lasts any, any, any time, um, anywhere between one to two weeks. For home hemo, it is about five to six weeks of training. Um, and um, 
they, they are um, educated about that, and then they are evaluated by our RN and, and the MD here. Um, then they are also evaluated um, by the dialysis social worker to understand their psychosocial situations, if there's any help they would need in order to succeed with home dialysis. And then finally, we do the home evaluation where um, one of the, uh, one of the um, team members goes and visits the, the house and takes a look and sees what the condition is, is it, um, and if there is any changes that can be made or need to be made in order to do home dialysis and then we um, we try to identify any barriers that we think may be may um, prevent them from learning about farming home dialysis and if these are something which are modifiable we try to work with the patient to help them uh, maneuver through that and then finally once we we have all we've done all these kinds of evaluations and, and we have talked to the patient we, we prepare the patient for the access placement either if they choose a home hemodialysis we work on getting them the AB fistula and getting it mature if the patient chooses to do PD we get the PD catheter when the patient is ready to start dialysis and that is usually our way of going with our patients um, with that, I'm going to just summarize my talk. Um, so I'm, as we went through the talk, home dialysis has many benefits uh, over conventional hemodialysis, um, starting from pa better uh, patient satisfaction to improved outcomes with intensive eye therapy, and we went through them in detail um, earlier. Uh, patient education is is the biggest tool that can help in increasing the utilization of home therapies. Um, there, are, there are many misconceptions surrounding home dialysis among providers and patients, uh, e even among some nephrologists, honestly, and that affects the patient's choice of therapy. So we have to keep that in mind. And I think we as providers have the capability to help patients see the benefits of home dialysis or home-based dialysis therapies and help them make an informed choice so that they can have a better quality of life on dialysis. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to and my talk, thank you so much for listening and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. We do have some questions in the chat already. I'm gonna open the chat right now. Yeah. So, the, so the first one says, an earlier slide said home dialysis was cheaper. A later slide said that one of the factors that hindered the choice of home dialysis was financial. Absolutely. Talk a little bit so, about that. I'm gonna I'm gonna address that. So uh, the the first the slide that I showed was basically the cost of doing um, peritoneal dialysis. Um, at home. And this is the Medicare cost structure that we see with how much money the, the government is spending on these patients. The second part, the financial part, which we, I did not go into detail in terms of the barriers is the the reimbursement for the for the physician part of the uh, of the, the fee structure is higher for in-center dialysis compared to the home dialysis. And so the maximum incentive that you have for um, for in, uh, is is about 18% higher than that for home dialysis. And I think that can sometimes disincentivize uh, physicians from promoting home dialysis, you know, and that was the barrier that I was talking about, which I did not go into detail um, because I thought it may not be relevant to our talk right here. But yes, that is something that disincentivizes um, hemo, uh, uh, home dialysis compared to the in-center dialysis. Uh, having said that, the cost structure for our, like the cost saving for the society is much better with PD despite despite that barrier. So that's the point I was trying to make. And there's another question. Uh, there's a question asking you to go through some of the specifics of home dialysis, like the equipment, um, you know, and a brief description of the techniques that, that you do. I think just so people want to understand it. Better. Sure. So um, the the exact equipment. So for, if we talk about PD, um, the PD has, um, with the machines that we use are really like tabletop machines. They are, um, they are pretty small. Um, they can fit on the nightstand actually. Um, and, um, and the solutions take a little bit more space than the actual machine. Um, and these supplies, um, they can be stored. So the way it works is we have the supplies, the solutions of the PD. If you have seen patients in the, in the hospital setting, they have about um, five to six liter bags that we use with the machine uh, that can be connected to the machine and then the patient gets that, that therapy overnight. Um, they usually, um, so that would be the PD machine. If you were to do manuals, all you need is a hook uh, or like a, a pole with a hook so that you can hang the bag and do the manual machine, the manual dialysis. For HHD, uh, it's a little bit bigger. So it's about, I would say maybe about um, uh, 
18 by 18 inch, like a, a, a cube box, that is the dialysis machine. If you've seen the next stage machine in the ICU, that would be the size of the machine. Basically, it's the same uh, similar kind of machine that we see here. And then there is, uh, if the patients were to, to make the dialysis at home, there is another, I actually should have put some pictures to show you that, I'm sorry about that. Um, but, um, but it doesn't take a lot of space, honestly, in terms of the actual machine. What takes the space is the other supplies that come with the, both with the PD and the HHD that requires a little bit more space than that. Um, the number of hours with each technique. So PD again is more of a continuous therapy that we can usually, we, what we try to do is we have the patients hook onto the machine overnight and they get about eight to nine hours, sometimes 10 hours of therapy overnight, depending upon um, what their requirements are. Um, and then during the daytime, they do keep the fluid. Most of the patients will keep fluid in their belly to help them do the dialysis, which is called a long dwell uh, during the daytime. With the HHD, we have more frequent dialysis. So most of our patients do either four to five times a week dialysis. And that varies from patient's actual size to what their requirements are, but usually about two and a half to three hours of dialysis um, over a, a more frequent um, a, a time period. And brief description of the technique. So PD, the way peritoneal dialysis works is basically you have a PD catheter put into the peritoneal cavity, and then the fluid is, is instilled in. Uh, you leave it there for, to dwell. There is exchanges that happen um, across the peritoneal membrane in terms of the, the solutes and the, the BUN and the creatinine. And then what you do is you drain that fluid out. So this is basically a very simple mechanism of diffusion. Um, well, there are many other... Um, involvement, but basically you're, you're using the peritoneal membrane as a semi-permeable membrane across which the, the exchange is happening. Um, the hemo, the home hemodialysis is very similar to what you see in the, in the in-center dialysis where there is a dialyzer which has a membrane and then on one side your blood circulates and the other side is a dialysate and the exchange happens across that dialyzer. Um, so we can, we can probably talk about that in a in a separate talk, but I um, but I hope I made it clear to uh, to the person. There's another. The, the next question is really around some more of the practical stuff. Like, is it a special water supply, and is it portable to be taken on airplane trips, for instance? Yes. So. Um, logistical limitations to enable home HD. So H, yes, we do check the water supply. So there's no special water supply. First of all, we use the tap water that we use for every other purpose, but that goes through a, 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 a water purification system um, that helps create a very like pure and um, uh, basically a pure water that you can use to make the dialysate. So that, but the tap water should have certain characteristics. And I can tell you uh, that in New York City water is great. We have never had any problems. We never failed a patient based on like the water supply. So yes, um, do you require regular water supply, but then you help that. There is also the option of doing dialysis with the bags for, uh, for hemodialysis also. So we do uh, where the solutions come. Now the amount of dial the dialysis that we require for home hemodialysis is much less than what we use for in-center. It's that it makes it a little gentler dialysis, but it works pretty well. We saturate the dialysis pretty well with the home hemodialysis. Um, the, the machine is portable. There is a case that comes for the patients to keep the machine in, and that can be um, they, that can be taken in airlines. They um, we just write them a letter, and they the equipment is taken without a problem. So and it is considered to be a medical equipment, and they they are taken care of. So uh, absolutely, it can be taken on air trips. Our patients have done. Um, uh, the cruise trips with that, and there are cruises that allow that to be done. So yes, patients travel, which is a big one. Mm -hmm. There's one more question that says, home dialysis is rarely discussed when we initiate RRT for inpatients. Are some patients who get HD in an outpatient center educated and transition to home dialysis? Yes. So um, we try, at least at Mount Sinai, we have been trying more to, first of all, uh, focus on the patients who start inpatient and see if they are willing to have that discussion and uh, to talk to them about the various modalities. But uh, when, when patients are in inpatient uh, and they have crashed into the ER, it's a little hard to have that conversation when, we're, when they're dealing with their own emotional um, and uh, and. Uh, the, the burden of starting dialysis, I would say, but yes, we do. Once the patients are in the in center, it's uh, as I said earlier in my talk that CMS requires us to talk about that 
it's maybe may not be done in the best possible way at, at all the centers, but we make an, a big effort to actually educate our patients on those dialysis. We revisit those patients and tell them um, about the home dialysis options. And if they are uh, if they are willing to transition, we absolutely uh, do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, are there any insurance issues around commercial insurance or Medicaid and Medicare? Absolutely, uh, at least not at Mount Sinai. We take all the insurances, even emergency Medicaid. <laughs> oh, great. Someone texted me that question. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's great. Well, thank you. That's our last question. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma, for coming today. Obviously, a lot of interest from the questions, and it was great for us to, to hear about uh, all that you're doing with us here. So thank you very much.